Mm. Kind of thought this would be the last one in a sweater. It is cold. Have you ever met someone who just makes you feel at home? These people have the gift of hospitality like you've known each other forever. Folks like this are able to grace you with their presence. They have the gift of making you feel like there is nowhere else they'd rather be and no one else they'd rather be with than right there in that moment with you. They're able to fill the space with their presence to carve out and create a holy space of some sort. Well, today we continue the second part of our year-long sermon series, the second part called Out of Egypt. And we will see God and the people of Israel carving out a space for the presence of God among them. So far in part two of our series, we've seen the birth of Moses, the plagues on Egypt, and the release of Israel from captivity. Last week, we read how God gave the Ten Commandments to to teach the people how to live, how to be human again after centuries in slavery. This all took place in Exodus chapter 20. Well, today we'll be in Exodus chapter 40. So here's an all too brief overview of what's happened since then. While the Ten Commandments are the most famous, God gives Moses a bunch more laws to govern the people, laws dealing with how to treat workers and slaves, how to handle disputes between people, how to make restitution for stolen or damaged property, laws about social justice and sexual immorality, laws about how much or how little interest to charge when lending money, laws about giving tithes and first fruits to God, and laws about the Sabbath and festivals. Also laws about not boiling a young goat in its mother's milk. You know, laws. Moses tells the people God's laws in Exodus chapter 24, and they reply, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses writes all these laws down in what is known as the Book of the Covenant and reads it aloud. Again, the people promise to obey the laws of God. God makes a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel. God calls Moses to Mount Sinai and communes with him for 40 days and 40 nights. While Moses is with God, God writes the Ten Commandments on stone tablets in Exodus chapter 24. God then gives Moses incredibly intricate plans for a place of God's dwelling, a place on earth where the presence of God would be tangible, where God would be with them. When I say intricate plans, I mean intricate plans. From Exodus chapter 25 through Exodus chapter 30, detailed plans. As part of these plans, God commands the construction of the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, which sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant. You may have seen this on Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. The plans for the Ark start in Exodus 25.10. It's not just something they made up. While Moses is on the mountain, the people grow tired of waiting and begin to do people things. They call upon Aaron, Moses' brother, to create a god for them to worship. Aaron calls the people to bring him gold so they could fashion it into an idol. They create a golden calf and say, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And they make burnt offerings to this statue and feast. Uh-oh. God tells Moses, Go down to your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. They've corrupted themselves. God is super mad and wants to destroy the people. God even offers to start a new great nation with Moses, the same deal that he offered to Abraham. But Moses calls on God to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promises God made to them in God's covenant. Chapter 32, verse 14 says, And the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. The next chapters of Exodus see the Israelites commanded to move on from Mount Sinai. They deal with the troubling ramifications of the whole golden calf debacle, and eventually they begin constructing the tabernacle, a mobile tent where God's presence would dwell amongst the people. In Exodus chapter 34, God renews the covenant with Israel. God sets them apart again as the people of God. They are different than all the other nations of the world. 
They are God's people and are expected to live God's way according to the law. Then Moses begins to make all the provisions for the furnishings of the tabernacle. You know, sometimes reading Exodus and books like it, it's really difficult because if you've read Exodus chapter 25 through 30, it repeats itself in Exodus 35 through 39. Essentially, Moses makes all the stuff God told him to make in the way that God told him to make it. Moses calls upon skilled craftsmen to begin construction. Lamp stands, the altar of burnt offering, the coverings for the tent, a bronze basin, an altar of incense, a table for the bread of presence, veils of fabric and curtains, investments for the priest. Cool things like the breast piece of judgment and a bedazzled ephod and a blue robe with dried pomegranates around the hem and a sash embroidered with needlework. Oh, and a, a golden bell to go on it as well. All this leads us to the last chapter in the book of Exodus, chapter 40 the final provisions for the tabernacle. Again, Exodus 40 repeats itself quite a bit. There are commands of the Lord and then Moses does it. Let's take a look at Exodus 40 verses 16 through 38. It says this, Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. In the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Moses set up the tabernacle he laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the covenant and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the cover above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the curtain for the screening and screened the ark of the covenant as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain and set the bread in order on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the curtain and offered fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also put in place the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set up the court around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the screen on the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. Interesting how the passage starts out, isn't it? Verse 17 says, in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. So what? I mean, why is it important for us to know what the date is? Well, it just so happens that the tabernacle is to be erected just two weeks shy of the first anniversary of the exodus from Egypt. It's exactly nine months after the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai. This passage and all of Exodus, really, contains so many little details that seem trivial and unimportant. It's easy to get lost in it all. Let's take a look at verses 9 and 10. It says, Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it shall become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar shall be most holy. One of the things that gets lost in the shuffle is the role of Moses. Moses is to anoint and consecrate and wash. 
Moses is charged to anoint all the tabernacle with oil to make it holy. Moses is instructed to wash Aaron and his sons in order to purify the priesthood. Through Moses, at God's command, the altar of burnt offering will become most holy, or another way of saying it, the holy of holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant lies, where the mercy seat is, where the presence of God resides right in the midst of the people. By God's command, Moses is the vessel that God uses to set what had been made into something other, something set apart, something holy. Through Moses, God sets common and ordinary elements apart for the extraordinary purposes of bestowing God's grace on the people. Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? One commentator writes that having this text is like being present at the institution of a sacrament. The holy God becomes present, palpable, and visible in the earth. God, who has bestowed upon us sacraments as visible means of invisible grace. In the tabernacle, God has created a way that God's presence can now be in the world. And through Moses and his brother's family, the Levites, an enduring and reliable religious practice is made possible. When Moses completes the task God has given, did you notice what the narrator said? Moses finished the work. Where else have you seen this word before? Well, theologian Joseph Blankensop draws a compelling parallel between creation, which is finished in Genesis 2, and the tabernacle, which is also finished in Exodus 40. He pointed out something I'd never seen before. Did you notice how many times the scripture says Moses did just as the Lord commanded? Seven times. And seven is a magic number. Seven may allude to Moses' complete obedience, yet where did we hear this number seven before? What's the first time seven becomes a big deal? Creation, right? So here, seven may refer to a new creation in a tent in a tabernacle. The verb for finish here is the same one used in Genesis 2 to conclude the work of creation. With Moses, this is a new finishing. The new world becomes in new time. It's a a movable tent, a precursor to the temple, a precursor to the church. It is finished. If you're a Christian, where where have we heard it is finished before? That's right, the fourth gospel. John chapter 19 records Jesus' declaration from the cross. It is finished. It's a triumphant cry asserting that God's purpose had been fulfilled and fully accomplished. Also in John, Jesus asserts that he will finish God's work. The opening to John's gospel says, the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The verb here, lived among us, tabernacled. Jesus, the word of God, took on flesh and moved right into the neighborhood. Nahum Sarna is a Jewish scholar, and he writes that the function of the tabernacle was to create a portable Sinai, a means by which a continued avenue of communication with God could be maintained. As the people move away from the Mount of Revelation, they need a visible, tangible symbol of God's ever-abiding presence in their midst. You ever felt like that before? Looking, searching, hoping for any avenue of communication with God, anything that resembles the visible, tangible symbol of God's presence in your life? Me too. But here's the deal. I think in our longing for God's presence, like the Hebrew scriptures, one of the dangers is is that we can really romanticize it. This visible, tangible symbol of God's ever-abiding presence in their midst, the tabernacle, it actually transitions to the temple in Jerusalem. And the New Testament teaches us that Jesus becomes the living, breathing presence of God, God in the flesh. For Jesus' followers, The presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem transitions to dwell inside individual believers after the resurrection. The gathering of believers becomes the church of Jesus Christ, a visible, tangible symbol of the kingdom of God. We've been given tangible symbols. We've been given Jesus Christ. We've been given the bread and the cup, the new covenant, the waters of baptism. We've been given each other. We've been given the church. These are all places we can experience the tangible presence of God in our lives. These are places of new creation, places where we can catch a glimpse of God's goodness and mercy and grace. 
These are places of new covenant, places of restoration and newness, places where we are reminded of God's never-ending steadfast love. It feels like home. When was the last time that you came home? When was the last time you gathered for worship expecting to feel the presence of God in our midst? When was the last time that you were aware that you carry the presence of God with you to others? God still longs to be present in your life and in mine. And in fact, I believe God is present with us. We just struggle to recognize it easily or often. As we experience Lent together, may you recognize that God has longed to be near, to be present with us since the very beginning. May you know that through Jesus Christ, God's presence dwells within you and within me. May you experience God's tangible presence in you today as you come home and gather in worship. May you see the presence of God in each other as well.